Most bankers aren't ready to help you until after their third cup of coffee. But with Central National Bank's after-hours service, you don't have to wait for the bank lobby to open to get help. You can contact us from 6 to 8.30 in the morning or from 5 to 10 in the evening, and we'll connect you to a real, live, local person who can answer questions and fix problems seven days a week. Bank different. Bank central. Central National Bank. Member FDIC. What I'm going to say. Is that what you're going to say? Because I, I would say it right now because I'm, I'm recording now. Oh, Hey, what's up, Blazer fans? Welcome to a special playoff edition of the Blazer's Edge podcast. I'm Tara, back with Danny Meringue. Blazer's Edge is part of the Almighty Baller Radio Network. You can find us wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And please, if you like what you're hearing, rate, review, subscribe, all of that good stuff. We're just going to do a quick podcast tonight to provide an <laughs> overview. Quick. Yes, it's going to be quick matchup. We're going to provide an overview of the playoff matchup against the New Orleans Pelicans and just talk about some things to watch for in game one. Look at you in playoff form here. You you nailed the intro, got got everything in there. And then like you went with you went with the uh, the vanilla playoffs. I'm trying to raise the bar. You went with the vanilla New Orleans, not a Nolans, not a New Orleans, New Orleans, just a very just steady, subtle. New Orleans. Well, if that's the only thing you're going to pick apart, I feel like I'm I, already I, ahead. I, I thought maybe with you being being you know in the South right now, maybe you'd, you'd go with a strong Nolans or New Orleans. Mm-hmm. You could throw a Can little start French, this again? A little French Cajun in there. No, no, okay. You're, you're just you're just trying to drag this out because I said it was going to be a short podcast. Oh come on! So this, anyway, this is me. The this playoffs are exciting because you get to watch a whole series of games against one team and see how teams adapt to each other. So I had a bunch of questions I wanted to ask you about how to how the how to watch you know the how to watch this series and i figured i might as well call you up and put it on record because other people might want to do yeah well, let's let everybody know you were going to ask these questions of to me regardless so exactly the, the, the idea was so i figured let's just record you asking me these questions so we can get it's the called answers efficiency on dan hey I, I, i'm all about it. come on if anybody's about efficiency it's not you it's not so me. let's start off Let's start off by noting a few things about what happened when these two teams played against each other during the regular season. And then you can tell me a couple of things uh, <laughs> that you want to, that you're going to keep your eyes on during the matchup. And I got a couple of things that I'm thinking that I'm going to watch. <laughs> so just to recall, wind it back. Can you believe the regular season is over? First of all, I, I can't, I feel uh, like it just started yesterday. Yeah. It went by really you probably slow feel like times. it's been a hundred years. Yeah. It went by really slow at times and then it sped up. And then these last two weeks have been pretty crappy to be honest. So it, it was nice to end it on a high note. Let's just, let's put it that way. Yeah. The game against Utah the other night was, was nice, but to roll back in time, the games against New, New Orleans were pretty spaced out this year. They played in October, uh, um, the Blazers won that game. It was 103 to 93 in that game. Anthony Davis only played five minutes and then he got injured. So they were without Anthony Davis for most of that game in December, the Blazers lost to the Pelicans. It that was, was ugly. 116. Yeah. Boogie had 38 points and there was no Anthony Davis in that game either. January 12th, another dark time for the Blazers and another loss at the hands of New Orleans. That was 119 to 113. The, and the Pelicans had both Anthony Davis and Boogie for that game. And, they and then finally, <laughs> well, it was, it was, I can't remember what the rhythm of that entire game was, but none of these games ended with a giant gap. Then finally, the last one was March 27th, a win 107-103, of course, with no boogie. So that's how the games have played out so far this year. And like I said, like the biggest win was in October by 10, and their biggest loss was by 7. So it wasn't like a huge you know, there were no massive blowouts that mm-hmm. I can remember. Were any of them like, did they have huge gaps that just got closed at the yeah, end? Yeah, like, the the yeah. first AD list game, so not the one where he got injured, but the one where Boogie went nuts. The the Pelicans controlled that game. Yeah, that was okay. that was that was all Pels all the time, and that was that was bad. That was that, <laughs> those were the dark days of the season. Right. That was when the the offense had really 
disappeared. Yeah, it was non-existent. The defense was playing really well, but like they, they couldn't score at all at that point in the season. Well, so what are the things that you're going to watch for in game one of of the series? Not even just game one. These, these are these are series-long trends that I think are going to hold pretty true. Uh, coaches will adjust and some things will change, but the, the big one here that I've heard people talk about is the pace. And I think pace is a really, really important thing for this series because the Pelicans play the fastest pace in the league. 102.7. Mm-hmm. They, they get up and down the floor. And with Anthony Davis, it's a good thing to do. And so it kind of got me thinking like where Portland and how Portland has played um, in those particular situations. So I went through, went back through and sorted through all the games this season where the Blazers played at or above that pace. 13 games. You know what the record was in those 13 games? 10 and 3. See, I didn't give you a chance to answer the rhetorical. I'm not, I'm not, not even giving it to you. <laughs> Good. I didn't feel like I was being quizzed. Nope, nope. See, I'm, I'm, I'm leading right into it. So that's kind of a good sign in my opinion. The Blazers show that they can do it. Now, there's certainly some hesitation in that aspect because the Blazers don't typically play at that pace, but that's a pretty decent sample size, and I think that's something that can, that can bear some fruit as the series progresses. Um, one of those three losses, though, however, is to the Pelicans. So they can win against the Blazers at that pace. So that's something to kind of keep in mind in the back of your heads, at least, um, going into the so series. I, 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 w- I was checking out the pace. The way the Blazers play against the Pelicans is, of course, faster than normal. I mean, that's not surprising. The mm-hmm. Blazers themselves are, I think, number 19 in yeah, the they, league. Yeah, they hovered around 19 and 20. I think they ended the season 19th. So, I mean, that's that's pretty low, but they seem to be able to keep up with the Pelicans largely at that pace. So what was it what it is about the Blazers that you think makes them adaptable like to such a wide variation? Because it was a pretty broad variation. They're regularly 98.8, and then against the Pelicans, they were 103.4. Substantially faster. Um, yeah, so what, what, what do you think what made it so that Portland could keep up? Damian Lillard. Damian Lillard is fully capable of, of playing at a fast pace. I think there are other guys in this team that aren't necessarily built for that. But Dame is very, very adaptable when it comes to pace. And when, So why do you think they didn't do it for all the other games? Because there's other guys in this team that, that aren't aren't maximizing their potential in that aspect. CJ McCollum and, and Yusuf Nurkic are the two big ones. Nurkic doesn't want to run the floor that much. He's seven foot, 280 mm-hmm. pounds. CJ McCollum <laughs> is a rhythm player. Like, CJ doesn't feast in the open court or in fast breaks uh, in transition. Um, he's, he's, that's just not his game. Um, he did well against Utah the other night, kind of coming out of his, his shooting funk, but he also got into the paint quite a bit. Um, the reverse finish on Gobert was beautiful, um, in traffic on the backside. That, I mean, if CJ can do that kind of thing against the Pelicans, that, I think that, that bodes well, but that's not how you typically see him play and perform. And so that, that's kind of, that kind of precludes Portland from really playing that way all the time. But Damian Lillard? Um, Mo Harkless is, is obviously huge in that aspect, and he probably won't be available to at least, at least game three. I'm probably looking closer to game five. But um, mm-hmm. the second unit, Pat, Baz, Wade Baldwin, he could end up being a dark horse in this. We saw Terry Stotts pull him out against Utah after not playing previously against Denver. Um, he's an athletic guy that can definitely get up and down the floor. He can he can score in the open court. Um, he's quick. I've noticed he's quite fast. Uh, if you were if you were going to ask me who the most dynamic athlete is, taking into account positioning, length, speed, explosiveness, it, I would be it would be very hard for me to not take Wade Baldwin. Like that that's hmm. not the reason that he was he was let go by Memphis. Lack of athleticism. He's got a six foot ten inch hmm. wingspan, incredibly quick, side to side. First step is great. Um, he's explosive at the rim. So those are the kind of things where I don't see him being a huge contributor, but I could definitely see him doing some things um, that can change the flow of a game on the momentum side. So if Portland picks up the pace against New Orleans, do you think that it's because the Pelicans are dictating the pace of the game or it's because Portland is choosing to play faster? Well, or, the, I mean, So do, I guess the flip side of that is do you think Portland could try to slow down the Pelicans? I think they're going to try and find a middle ground. The playoffs slow down anyways. Possessions mean mm-hmm. more. So naturally, it's going to slow down a little bit. Um, but I think that Portland is going to have a difficult time not playing fast because Drew Holiday, Rajon Rondo, Anthony Davis, each one more, Miller, they're, they're all guys who want to run. 
Like there are very few guys on that team that don't want to get out and run. So you can try and slow down all you want, but they're still going to push tempo. And with that in mind, you just kind of have to keep it in the back of your head that, hey, they're they're gonna they're gonna push the pace here and try to make things happen. That, that's just, that's okay. just the long and short of it. I mean, even Miritich is enjoying <laughs> getting up and down the floor. The speed. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, pace is one thing that we all we're all gonna have our eyes on. What's another thing that you're gonna have your eyes on? I know you sent some uh, images over of some of the shot charts, especially yep. Gobert and Nurkic. Is that something you want to talk about? Davis and Nurkic. Yes. Um, oh yeah. Sorry. No, no. You're, 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 you're still you're still in Utah frame of mind. I got you. <laughs> oh, I said Gobert. Yeah. It's a time zone difference. It's just screwing with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the things people are really worried about right now is Alfred Camino covering Anthony Davis for long periods of time. And that's, that's a real thing. And that's not the shot at Alfred Camino. Anthony Davis is probably going to finish third in MVP voting, probably right in front of Damian Lillard. Um, what AD has done the second half of the season has been nutty. Um, expecting Aminu to try to take him on all game and all series long by himself is probably not something that's going to happen. It's going to be by committee. That's why you want a guy like Harkless back. Uh, Ed Davis will take a turn. I, I think that for portions of the time, you'll see Yusuf Nurkic on that. And that's, this is, I think, a key beyond pace is who gives into whose style? Will Terry Stotts play big mm-hmm. and leave Nurkic out there? Or will he opt to go smaller and let AD kind of have the advantage on both ends? But one thing to keep in mind here, People are worried about Anthony Davis spreading the floor and shooting. In the minutes that he played against Portland this season, he attempted one three. One. Yeah, that was shocking when I saw when I saw that. Because he's he took and it wasn't like he doesn't take many threes. No. He takes he takes quite a quite a few. How do you remember how many his total was for the year? No, no, it's off the top of my head. Um but Okay. It was well over 100, I Yeah, believe. no, no, he, he's, he's acquitted himself as a shooter. But then you look at what he did basically inside 10 feet, and it was monstrous. I mean, he's 4-7 mm-hmm. on the left side, 3-3 three three on the right side, 23-31 inside uh, 5 feet. So he did his damage at the rim. Why? At least in my opinion, because he had Al Farouk Aminu on him for long stretches. So, in my opinion, I'm, I want Terry Stotts to stay big. Let Anthony Davis shoot outside. As, a, as good as he's gotten at being able to knock down that jumper, Anthony Davis at the rim is a whole hell of a lot more lethal than Anthony Davis on the perimeter. So, you think that they're going to try to force Anthony Davis to take threes this time? If I'm Stotts, when he's only that's taken one do. against them this whole time. Now, here's the kicker to this, though. Alvin Gentry is the biggest troll in the NBA among coaches. Think about when... <laughs> what do you mean by that? How, can, how, can, where did you come I, up I, with I, that I'm going to go back to this. Because <laughs> the look on his face when he was coaching against the Trailblazers in the playoffs with the Phoenix Suns. Remember LaMarcus Aldridge getting double teamed endlessly every time he tried to post up? And turning the ball over left, right, and center, he just couldn't get it going. That was his wrinkle. He's like, fine, I'll let you post up LaMarcus Aldridge, and I'm going to send a double team from the baseline. I'm going to send a double team from the corner. I'm going to send a double team from the top. I'm going to send a double team from from the opposite side of the post. You're never going to know where it's coming from, and he's going to be so flustered that he doesn't know what he's doing out there all game long. So what I expect will happen is that Gentry will put Anthony Davis on the perimeter and force use of Nurkic out of the paint and then attack on the other side with Drew Holiday and Rajon Rondo and then let Anthony Davis come in off a cut, forcing Nurkic to try to defend on the move as opposed to being his typical ice defense and within 10 feet of the rim. Okay, so you think that they're going to they're gonna keep Anthony Davis on the perimeter, forcing Nurkic to chase him out there, and then, and then they're going to send in help from the other side and that's going to make Nurkic have to run back and forth in between the rim and the three point line. Yep. And then it's try to make the him decide. chaos. Anthony Davis will slip through. He, if he doesn't slip through, he's open on the perimeter. Portland either has to rotate or Nurkic has to make a decision. And that's the, that's why the did they of, not do that for four other games? Like don't show your, <laughs> because you don't, you don't show your hand in the regular season. You think season. it was a matter of just 
we we know that we may see Portland in the playoffs, so let's mm-hmm. not show this. Or do you think they were playing that against? Well, I mean, he was definitely taking threes against everybody. I think yeah. it's. I I think you have a. I think that's that's a. Well, it's worth watching, but I don't know if I think that that's what's going to happen. I, I think it's going to be a big time wrinkle. I think they're going to try yeah, to move Nurkic around. Suddenly he's going to be shooting those threes. Not even just shooting, just pulling Nurkic away, making Portland make a decision. Now instead of having Nurkic on him, who's Nurkic guarding? You have to make a decision. Like, is it worth it to keep it? He's going to pose the question to Terry Stotts: Is is it worth it to have Nurkic out there if Emeka Okafor isn't on the floor? Now, if Okafor is on the floor, then Aminu's on Davis. There's, there's no doubt about it. And 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 Nurk's on Okafor. But what if it's so what if it's when, Miritich and Davis? When, when Nurkic isn't on the floor, wait. So what about when when Nurkic isn't on the floor? Then Anthony Davis probably won't be on the floor. So we won't. Do you think we'll have, there'll be many situations where they've got Ed Davis and uh, Zach Collins out there at the same time as Anthony Davis, or are they just going to take if if Zach Collins is in, they're just going to make sure it's not when Anthony Davis is in? I would assume that Collins is going to match up on Davis at times. Um, and again, this is not shaded. At Zach Collins, but he's not ready for Anthony Davis. I well, see, that's one of those things why I think it's interesting for game one, because for game one, I could see Stotts putting uh, putting Zach Collins out there and seeing how it goes for, for one game. The, I can, so one I can see I'm how, really how it in is who's going to play. Yeah, yeah and, that, and that's the thing is like how Terry Stotts' history with rookies is one that, as a coach, doesn't trust them. He, now, he's shown some trust in Zach Collins, but he's also shortened up Zach's minutes as the season has, has progressed. He, he's shortened yeah, the leash sure. on him a little bit. And I think he'll try. I think he'll give Zach the opportunity, but I, I don't think Zach is quite ready. Now, if he proves that he is ready, that's a boon for Portland. But mm-hmm. Anthony Davis is an MVP candidate for a reason. He, he's right. going to get his. Zach may make some plays on him, and I expect him to make some plays. But I also, also expect him to get absolutely torched at times by AD. And that's not... That's not a shot at Collins. That's just, it's Anthony Davis, one of the five best players in the league. Right. And I just see this as something as like a perfect scenario to play out in game one that we might not see in game four or five. Yeah, or you, you, if, if it turns out that Collins isn't ready, I could see his minutes being restricted to non-Anthony Davis time. Like putting him on, near, right. on Miritich is perfectly fine. Putting him on mm-hmm. Solomon Hill. Perfectly fine. Hell, even if you wanted to play him down on a guy like each one more or um, Darius Miller to put him on the perimeter there, I, I think that's perfectly fine. But I, you definitely don't want to put a rookie, any rookie really, on Anthony Davis for long periods of time because that's just going to give yeah. AD the green light, and he doesn't need any more of that. Sure, sure. I, I think it'll be interesting to see how much time he does get in that first one. And, you know, I think you're right. He's going to have to either acquit himself right away or that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can see shot Stotts having a very short leash. And then, again, but I, that's, but not, I that's, not, a, that's why... not shaded at, at Collins. That's just that's how not just him, but most coaches in the NBA operate. Well, and I, I can see why he would want to try him out because physically it makes sense. Have... He well, he does have that experience playing deep in you know the NCAA. Did they did they make it all the way to the finals or just the semifinals? Yeah, no, I can't remember. They, they made, they made, the final they, made game. they made all the way to the finals. Yeah. So, I mean, he, he has those those big star you know spotlight minute where, where that he big got spotlight trouble. minute experience. <laughs> My point is that I don't I don't know. I think that he has a, a better chance than some. I don't think the like moment's too big for him. Freezing. I don't. I don't think the moment's too big for him. I think that Anthony Davis is too big for him. But he also has that mobility to do some of those things that you were saying that mm-hmm. Anthony Davis might be testing. Yep. So I and, think in that aspect, it'll, it'll I, I, be, they'll they'll give it a shot. Yeah. One one of the things. The old to watch college for. try. <laughs> yep. The old college try. The, the flip side um, of this so, though is, is use of Nurkic. He has to be effective on the offensive end to justify being out there. Otherwise, what are you really gaining if Nurkic is being pulled away from the rim and not being a defensive stopper at the rim? So Nurkic yeah, has so got to go to work on the watching, other side. What exactly are you going to be watching for from Nurk? How he operates in the pick and roll. Like, okay. And, that, in, and that's in not offensive just... Offensive and pick and roll or offensively, also defending it? Offensively more, okay. more than defensively. Defensively, he's, he's fine in that aspect. Um, I, I pretty much trust him wholeheartedly in, in that respect. Because it's very simple for him for what he needs to do, even against a guy like Anthony Davis. Um, offensively, 
it's not just him scoring in the pick and roll, but it's his decision making and playmaking off the pick and roll. He needs to take a little more time when he catches. Uh, a lot mm-hmm. of times when he does catch on the roll and the corner shooter is open, he makes the pass immediately instead of Mason Plumley was very good at this. And so was Robin Lopez. Um, drawing the defense just that one step further away. Because when your corner shooters are Evan Turner or Al Farouk Aminu, guys who have struggled a lot lately, Pat Connaughton has struggled, Baz has struggled, hell, everyone struggled. Um, mm-hmm. But when your shooters are struggling, if you give them a little bit more space to work with and the pass is a little bit more timely and in the right spot, the, the better they are to, to take the shot, the higher the success rate, at least on paper. So I want to see some patience from him. Um, and what I've seen from him offensively and defensively for the past three weeks has really been great. He's, he's shown a ton when he struggled. He struggled shooting the ball last night against the Jazz. But in the same respect, he was still able to be effective on the offensive end by drawing the defense and scoring inside when, he, when Portland really needed it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's played fantastic. Yeah, he, and here's the thing. I, I said this on... Uh, on the uh, Locks on Nuggets podcast before theirs with, with Adam Mara's. Um, I think the most important thing for Portland in these playoffs, um, I think Damian Lillard has proven he's a primetime player in, in big moments. But even more than that, mm-hmm. <clears throat> I think Yusuf Nurkic is kind of a, a WWE star. The bigger the lights, the bigger the pomp and circumstance, the more pressure that's on him and the bigger the stage – the more he kind of gets into it, like mm-hmm. he, he feeds off that. And it's, it's an, I think it's an ego thing. And I, I think he uses it the right way more often than not. But I think playoff Nurkic is going to be a real thing. I, I think That's he lives true, for that. because we haven't seen much playoff Nurkic yet. Yeah, I think we, what, we've got we saw, thir- we only saw 13 minutes. Game. Yeah, 13 minutes against yeah. the Warriors. And here's the thing, and it's a lot to take him 13 minutes. But he put the fear of God in the Warriors. They didn't know <laughs> what to do with him. For those few minutes he was out there, the Moda Center went nuts. The Blazers' mm-hmm. offense was humming. He, like, they, physically, they didn't know how to handle him. And we saw it against Denver. When, he, when the lights are on him and he knew he was playing in Denver and there's some emotion there, whether he wants to admit it or not, 20-19 mm-hmm. and 19 and just a physically dominant presence. He threw Jokic around. He threw anybody that was on the paint. Mason Plumlee didn't stand a chance. Nobody mm-hmm. was stopping him when he got inside. He was a wrecking crew. And my only hesitation to seeing Nurkic really go off is the Blazers not getting him the ball. And that's, that's another key, I think, to this series, that when Nurkic is rolling, feed him. Let the big man eat. So what are the, what are the keys, do you think, to winning, taking the first game? I'm just taking it one game at a time because I yeah, just no, figure every um, game there's going to be adjustments. Home playoff game. It's to start the series. First time in years. Portland needs to feed off the crowd. They need to settle in. And <laughs> this is going to sound corny, but they need to settle in and assert dominance. Just just, just go, go pee all over the floor. I don't care what you got to do. <laughs> assert dominance. Oh, so classy, Dan. Hey, I'm all about Always it. Always keeping the podcast classy. <laughs> But, I mean, really, they need to. They need to set the tone right away. Don't, get, mm-hmm. don't let the moment be too big for you. Now, I'm not worried about the Damian Lillard. I'm pretty certain about C.J. McCollum, and I have high hopes for Yusuf Nurkic. The rest mm-hmm. of the guys on this team, are, with the exception of Harkless, are so even-keeled. Like, I, I don't worry about Ed Davis or Alfred Camino. Like, those, those guys, mm-hmm. you get to check them for a pulse half the time. <laughs> they're, they're just, they're just going to show up and, and do things. Whether or not Aminu yeah. hits his shots, that's a different story. But as far as like his attitude and his mentality coming into the game and into the series, uh, you don't have to worry about those guys. Uh, yeah. I think you Neither say one the of same, them is going to lose their cool. Yeah, I think you say the same thing about Connaughton. Shabazz is a little bit uh-huh. more of a wild card because I think he feeds on a little bit. But for the most part, I'm pretty comfortable with that. So I want to see them come out and set that tone right away. And then dictate the pace of play. Don't change, Terry's thoughts specifically, don't change what you do well to try to fit them. And that's what I mean by asserting dominance. You take over the flow of the game, the pace of the game, the style of the game, and you assert your game plan. Blow theirs up. That's what I want to see. 
And what do they do if they struggle, if they come out and struggle? What's the key to them keeping it together? Two words. Damian Lillard. What? Okay. That, that's, Damian Lillard needs to be that dude. The playoffs are about mm-hmm. superstars. Dame needs to be that superstar. Night in, night out, Damian know- Lillard needs to carry them to victory. The other guys can show up and have a big game, but Dame needs to be that flag bearer every night. Yeah, and I, I think this is the I think this the secondary part of that, I think it's Nurkic because he's he's so big and he has such a huge presence mm-hmm. on on the court that if he isn't if he isn't moving forward and charging ahead and if he's just running along behind to stay caught up, there's such a huge difference from there. And it's you know, it goes back to what I would talk about in the beginning of the season. Engage where versus, things Nurkic versus disengage. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, if, and if things aren't going well for the team, he'll wait till the team starts to make a run. Mm-hmm. But lately I've seen him take on more of the ability to say, you know what? We're struggling, but I'm going to keep doing my thing until we can all get caught up. I'm going to, I'm going to do my share of carrying the load. And I, I, I think that's really exciting and it bodes well for the team. I would like to see him. Again, assert dominance, and not in, in both in the physical play, but on the mental level. Get under people's skin, mm-hmm. chirp at people, push them around. Don't get in foul trouble. Be careful with that. But you, you got to have a jerk in the playoffs because it's going to get testy. And Nurkic can be that guy, and Portland needs him to be that guy, and I, he has to walk that line. I, but I have faith in him being able to do that. You saw him kind of get into it with Crowder the other night. And I, I kind of wish he would have laid the wood on Crowder for that cheap shot on Dame. Um, but I, I think you're right. I think that's a huge part of it. I count on Dame. I, I, I expect him to deliver. Nurkic being that guy. Because I think Nurkic has a legitimate chance to be the second most important guy on this team in the playoffs. Because there are very few mm-hmm. people in the league who can check him physically. So mm-hmm. if, if he shows up and, and he's ready to ball... If you get 16 and 10 out of Nurkic in this series, which is basically what he's been averaging the second half of the year, and he's physical and asserting his presence, like you said, that's, that's probably a win. I think there are very, very few nights where we saw against Denver where a good Nurkic night has been wasted. Mm-hmm. So we're, so just to wrap it up, because we're hitting our – I said we were going to keep this short – Things that we're going to watch for, we're going to watch pace. I'm going to watch and see who plays, who gets out there on the court. Mm-hmm. Summarize the last couple of things that you, points you want to make for what we're going to look for. Asserting dominance is a big thing, and I think it's not just this mm-hmm. series; it's 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 all playoffs long for every team mm-hmm. because you have a game plan. Mike Tyson, the great philosopher that he is, everybody's got a plan <laughs> until they get hit. Be the one mm-hmm. that throws the punch. You're going to get hit back, but make them change their game plan first. Be the one that forces mm-hmm. the adjustments. And I think that's probably the most important thing outside of individual play, being the aggressor, setting the tone. And I think that kind of stuff gets overlooked a ton where everybody wants to look at the individual players. And, the, and that it makes sense, but I think that's, as important, if not more important, when you're looking at a seven-game series. And then, obviously, how the individual matchups play with, with, um, with the bigs, with Anthony Davis and Yusuf Nurkic and how that kind of chess match goes. Those, those are the most important things that, I, that I'm looking at coming into this series. But I, I, I have to get you on this one because I've I got to get you on record before the series starts. Who, okay. win, who wins the series and in how many games? Oh, Dan, you know I don't like to make predictions. Yeah, I know. That's why I'm putting you on the spot. I'm going to take Portland in six. All right. That is that, that is a very, very good choice. And not because I said the exact same thing last night. <laughs> oh, you did? I yeah. wasn't listening. Yeah, I know. It does. What else is new? <laughs> Let's be honest. I, I just ramble on and you're like, is he done talking about things yet so I can move to the next question? Because, God... <laughs> Dan, you did a good job tonight. We kept it well under our regular time. We are and we haven't I even hit thirty minutes yet, so this is impressive. I think we should go ahead and wrap it up. This is gonna be so fun to have the first game be in Portland. I'm unfortunately not gonna be there. I'm gonna be on a plane, so I'm gonna be just like 
incommunicado during the whole game, which is going to be very difficult. But Ooh. I'll get off the plane and I will be know there. The result. Not only in spirit, I'm sure it's going to be amazing. But in body, they, they they have decided to let me in the building for game one. Dun 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 dun. <laughs> well, you better stay positive. No being grumpy, Dan. Ah, no promises. But I do want to take <laughs> this this chance to let everybody know that there is a watch party that is being put on by NBC Sports Northwest and iHeartRadio that is going to be at the Baghdad Theater for Game 3. That's the first road game. That's Thursday. And the halftime show will be your Blazers Outsiders. So it's a cool Oh, cool are you going to do a dance? Are you going to put on, like, outfits and dance? Uh, we're going to do a quick change. And then I'm going to try to impersonate <laughs> Red Panda. I'm actually the one who stole her unicycle. Secrets out, folks. <gasps> You've been practicing this I, whole time. This whole time for this one segment that we're doing. But also... <laughs> Um, <laughs> if you come to that, you'll also get a double dose because Blazers Outsiders will be following for your post game coverage throughout the playoffs. So, uh, if you followed me on Twitter and listened to or heard or read the things I put on Twitter, but the interesting things that are coming, that's the first little bit. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll have you covered. Uh, I believe we're going to have the Rip City Drive with Travis and Chad and the Blazers official pregame show, um, Leading into the game at the Baghdad Theater, courtesy of Rip City Radio 620 and iHeartRadio. And uh, so, yeah, we got, some, we got some cool things cooking. So And that will be open to everybody. So, so we hope to ever see everybody there at the Baghdad Theater for game three. Blazers outsiders are everywhere. I don't know how much longer y'all are going to be able to call yourselves the outsiders. Yeah, I know. That's what's, what's crazy is they're letting us in the building. And I'm like, does this make me an inside outsider? Because normally I'm watching from, <laughs> from the parking lot. So I don't know. But yeah, yeah, it no, sounds about right. I, I, I'm pretty stoked for this series. Like Of all the matchups, I think this is the most fa- favorable for Portland. Um, I did not want to see the Spurs, especially after that last game. So I, I'm glad that, that the Pelicans were the draw and not the, the Spurs or even the Timberwolves. So. Um, and, yeah, and, and I, shout out to the I Nuggets love... real quick because the Nuggets missing the playoffs on a play-in game is just so Nuggets. And I know all the guys in Denver, and I feel bad for them. But better luck next year, suckers. Enjoy the summer. <laughs> all right, Yusuf. Hey, I, I got a channel in my Bosnian Beast. How about you, Terry? Right, you got, anything, well... got any plans here for the playoffs? Well, I'm going to see what unfolds when I get back in town. And then when I know what's going on and when I know what events and when they're going to be, I will, I'll know by uh, the next time we talk what events I'm going to be going to uh, for playoffs. Take we'll a talk about them. Because, yeah, this, this city, uh, it was Port- it's Portland is so much fun during the playoffs when everybody's walking around wearing nice. all their boys with gear, cheering, giving each other high fives, strangers. Stopping in the street, talking, <laughs> talking Blazers. It's real fun. So I guess let's go ahead and sign off for tonight. And we'll talk to you soon after game one. I'm at TCB Biggs on Twitter. Go ahead. Take us out of here. All right, fine. I'll take us out. You can follow me on Twitter at D Morang. Again, you can catch us, catch me, Shane and Jill on Blazers Outsiders following your post game wrap during all of the playoffs. And for Tara, I'm Dan. We were, again, you can find us on the Almighty Butler Podcast and Radio Network on Stitcher, on iTunes, anywhere else for your podcast needs. Like, subscribe, review, do all that good stuff. It does help us out a ton. And uh, until Sunday, we'll uh, catch you guys then. See you.